Asia said, and I'm in the philosophy department at Lehman College, and I'm also the director of the Disability Studies minor that we have uh, at Lehman. Um, I came to Disability Studies uh, late, I suppose. Um, the, my scholarship kind of uh, tells the story of my life. Um, and so uh, I started out um, in grad school. This is going on the web. I, think I, should stay this thing. Uh, I can cut things off. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's all right. Um, it's, I've published, I guess. So it's okay. uh, I started out in grad school and I met and married my husband, who's African American, and so I started doing race and ethnicity issues as a grad student back in the early 1990s. And then uh, when my daughter was 12, uh, she had a brain aneurysm and uh, became disabled. So then I, I, someone put me on to what's called the social model of disability, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I, I saw connections right away with the work I'd already been doing on gender and race and ethnicity. And so uh, I started doing disability and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So here I am. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today, give you an idea of kind of the arc of the disability rights movement, primarily in the United States, but with a, a little bit of a nod to some international contexts. Um, one pattern that you can see in disability issues and disability history in the United States is that um, disability issues often come up around wars. Um, the Civil War led to uh, a fairly um, impressive push uh, to change the way people with disabilities were treated, particularly men who were injured in the war. The same thing happened during World War I and World War II. Um, and so uh, we saw, and I, I focus on some of these folks in part also because I'm trying to bring in the New York context that some of these um, names might be familiar to you because we are in New York City. So um, Henry H. Kessler, uh, you may know the Kessler Institute, which is in New Jersey. Um, and he, he and his colleagues, Rusk was his student, um, began talking about a holistic approach to rehabilitation, where they talked about how rehabilitation had to, had to help the whole person, rather than just working on discrete bodily function. Um, and you may know Howard A. Rusk uh, because of Rusk. Institute, which is down on 34th Street. That's where my daughter spent part of her time in the pediatric unit there. Uh, and Beatrice wrote, Wright wrote a fairly influential book in 1959 called Psychology and Rehabilitation, which argued for this idea that, uh, that rehabilitation professionals should take a holistic approach to rehabilitation. Um, early disability organizations uh, some of the earliest disability organizations, as you can see, were those associated with uh, and representing people who were deaf and blind, the National Association of the Deaf, National Federation of the Blind, and the American Council of the Blind, which is a, actually a splinter group from the NFB. Um, they uh, had some disagreements and continue often to disagree. The NFB tends to support a uh, a philosophy uh, under which uh, blind people should be treated as normally as possible, and so they are opposed to some kinds of accommodations, or have historically been, and while the American Council for the Blind has tended to more aggressively push for uh, different sorts of accommodations. So there, there is some diversity of political views, as we'll continue to explore in the disability movement as well. All of these groups are, are still active. Um, the 1950s, 40s and 50s, we saw a push towards um, parent-initiated childhood disability organizations. So uh, some of these will be familiar to you. These um, organizations include the March of Dimes, the United Cerebral Palsy, 
uh, the Association for Health of Retarded Children, or AHRC, and the Association of Retarded Citizens, which is now called the ARC, for reasons we'll talk about a little later, having to do with the R word, which as I say, we'll talk about a little later. Um, so some of the early, again, some of the early disability organizations in the United States uh, were these parent-initiated uh, uh, disability organizations that focused a lot on children with disabilities. This, uh, this fact that many of these organizations were parent organizations um, led to quite a lot of controversy uh, because parents and I am one, so <laughs> don't always do the best job of representing the interests of their children or people with disabilities. Um, so the March of Dimes, for example, is famous for the many poster campaigns that it had uh, in the 1950s um, to try to get people to give money. Uh, and so these are some examples of some of the posters that they use. Um, what you see in these posters that, as a person with disability, you might find disturbing. They're mostly girls. Well, that's certainly true. There is a gender, there is a gender, with the exception of these two young men, there is a gender uh, bias. Well, I was going to say that there's um, two children at the same time. They have the, a girl that's not in the middle. Right, and what do you notice about the difference between, the, if you look at their faces, I know it's a little hard to take tiny, but yeah. I mean, the one who's not disabled is looking forward while the disabled people are looking towards that we have the guardian. Yeah, their mother probably. Yeah, and like they have to rely on Yeah. Right, so the impression is that, that they're dependent on their mother, who looks, as, as the website where I got this poster points out, she looks very concerned. And who's the only happy kid here? The one who's not the same. The one who's not the same, right. And, and what message would you say, say this poster sends? Very yeah, and she has to help her, right? So there, again, that image of sort of helplessness. And um, over here, does he look happy? No, he, he doesn't look too happy. So again, the image of the the uh, unhappy. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the imagery that's often perpetuated about people um, in Africa, right? Like when they're trying to get you to give. Yes. Organizations where like only yes. the, the only people shown are people who look like they're helpless and they're portrayed that way. Like they're shown in like most vulnerable states. And not saying that they don't would would wouldn't benefit from assistance, but not that people don't have any agency. And I think that there's some parallels here of what I'm seeing here. It seems like people don't have agency in the same way. Right, right. And it's and also about like then who's behind like, the creation of this piece these, um, this propaganda, right? right? Like, are they people who are connected to those demographics or are they not? And then what is the benefit or disadvantage of having them tell a story that is not their own? Right, right, so voice, yeah, um, yeah no, absolutely. This one is interesting. Um, Cindy Jones actually um, spoke about her experience as a poster child. Notice, you know, notice the, um, the, side by side uh, feature of this poster. Over here we have this happy running child. Over here, she looks happy, so there's that. But we have, uh, Cindy uh, had polio as a child. But look what it says. Vaccinate your family now against polio. Like, this is what you want. This is what you don't want. Right, so it's a very negative, right, although she looks happy, the implication is you're supposed to vaccinate your kids so your kid's not like this. And Cindy tell, told the story about how she felt like a Cinderella and like a princess as the poster child for the March of Dimes. 
And then sometime later when she saw this poster and realized that she, her image was being used as the person you're supposed to avoid mm -hmm. becoming, um, she was quite horrified. Uh, so um, the other, uh, one of the other um, things that was produced by many of these parent, uh, parent initiated organizations were the telephones. And the telephones also became highly controversial later on um, as the disability rights movement um, took off and as people with disabilities spoke in their own voice. So in 2015, they finally dumped the Labor Day telephone. telephone and this is a blog by Mike Ur Urban, and he's explaining why, as a person with disabilities, he's glad it's gone. Right? So what does he say? I spent many past Labor Day weekends joining other people with disabilities and protesting the telephone. We protested because we objected to the telephone's damaging narrative that depicted disabled people as nothing more than helpless victims. It implied that as long as we remain disabled, we have nothing to offer or contribute, that our hope, our only hope, was a cure. By pandering to pity, the telephone nurtured the very stigma of helplessness in which disability discrimination is rooted. It undermined the hard work of disability rights activists who have fought for decades to debunk that oppressive stigma. Um, so, so, what do you think of the telephones and and uh, the posters? What kind of image do you think these these portray of 